was enough in his works to uh, also condemn him, even though he was a terrible flapper. So there were other commotions uh, uh, that took place under Pontius Pilate, or uprisings. And then, of course, Eusebius puts his conclusion on, showing that from the time tumults, wars, plots, this is from the little apocalypse, never ceased one after the other until Vespasian siege overwhelmed them. Thus, divine justice overtook the Jews for their crimes against the Christ. Well, there it is. That's, uh, that, 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 that's his conclusion from all this. Not that they are a freedom-loving people, that they resist foreign uh, oppression, uh, brutality, uh, sexual misconduct, and so on and so forth. That everything has to do with the crimes against the Christ. And that is the official church position in 300 AD. But I don't think the documents support that position. You say, well, you're just wiggling out. No, I don't think I am. I think that is Greek anti-Semitism that has penetrated the, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole approach. And it doesn't affect anyone else. It does affect these poor people who, who, by the way, 20 centuries later, we see what finally happens to them. And a lot of people say, oh, that's okay. For the crimes against Christ, six million can go into the gas chamber. That's okay, too. But, well, in fact, I don't think it's okay. And it's time people did something about it. So I don't want to keep on that subject. But uh, I don't see much willingness to do anything about it. Maybe too late because I'm not sure that uh, what has, has happened hasn't just ultimately destroyed them finally, once and for all. Anyway, we have the famine here that um, we may or may not have spoken about. It's going to be spoken about in the Book of Acts, and this is uh, a time of Gaius. Uh, between the time the Gaius was uh, assassinated and Claudius took over. There was a famine, this is from the book of Acts, uh, that the prophet Agabus supposedly pre um, predicted. This is all from Acts, we'll get to it. So what's from Acts I'll put aside because we're going to cover it in the second part of the class when we look at Acts. Now we have, um, of course, also following Acts now. He's put Josephus aside, he's following Acts. About this time, Herod the king prepared to afflict the church and slew James the brother of John with the sword. That's a direct quote from Acts 11 and 12. I think it's 12, 1. Um, so he takes Acts and then he springs off into other early church uh, 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 materials. Clement, which is a, uh, was a second century writer from Alexandria, adds a narrative worthy of the seven, in the seventh book of his institutions. In other words, more material from Clement, who's in the 200s, or the 100s to the 200s. He said, the man who led them him to the judgment seat, seeing him bearing the testimony to the faith. See, there's an anecdote about uh, James, the brother of John, which we would expect more about Jesus, too. Uh, confessed himself a Christian. Therefore, says he, uh, both were led away to die. On the way, entreated James to be uh, forgiven of him. And James considered a little reply, Peace be to you, and kissed him, and both were beheaded at the same time. Now so that's a little apocryphal anecdote. I'm not sure I think it's uh, reliable, but the point of the matter is, is that uh, uh, there's some extra material that he finally is able to cull from the early church fathers about somebody. In this case, James, the brother of John. Uh, anyway, um, goes back to Acts here. Then, uh, seeing that the deed gave pleasure to the Jews, according to his. Uh, uh, take on it and the take of the book of Acts. He also imprisoned Peter. Uh, that is Herod uh, the king. Well, let's go back now. If you don't know this period of what we've been talking about, who is Herod the king? Who is he? Well, you automatically think it's Herod the Great, right? But Herod the Great died in 4 BC. So it's not Herod the Great. So which of the, the succeeding Herods? Is it, uh, is it Herod the Tetrarch? Uh, is it, who is it? Well, the Gospel writers and the Book of Acts don't, they don't know. That's how accurate their material is because they're writing second and third hand overseas. They, they know someone in the Herodian family did this and they just call them all Herod. But their knowledge is imprecise. Yes, yeah, unlike Josephus, who's much more precise, you say, well, if they're following Josephus, why didn't they make it more precise? Well, I don't think they took the trouble to make it more precise. So when were these materials, the Gospels, that were written? No, we know, but, uh, well, they're written in an Hellenistic environment with that. They're written in the Greek language. So, 
theories are bound, uh, where, anyway, they go through a redaction process, so we don't know where they finally emerge. A very good book on this is a, a, by um, S.G.F. Brandon, um, I think in the fall of Jerusalem in the early church, where he tries to identify geographical views where certain gospels appeared. He said one appeared in Syria, one appeared in Egypt, one appeared in, uh, in uh, Greece, and, or Asia Minor Greece, and another appeared in Rome. That, that, that's uh, probably uh, where you would expect them to have uh, emerged, so that's pretty, um, um, pretty um, I think, uh, I, you would expect that to be the case to some extent. But uh, you, his arguments are really interesting, why they all appeared, of course, after the fall of the temple that the fall of the temple influenced the writing of the Gospels. And uh, he's a Christian uh, clergyman, and I think he's a fair-minded person, and he, uh, he's read some good work. Brandon, S-G-F Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N. He also wrote a book called Jesus and the Zealots. He died in Egypt when he was looking for the Nag Hammadi materials after they'd been discovered. He was out in the Egyptian desert. He'd been a chaplain in, uh, in Montgomery's army in North Africa. Then he went to the University of Manchester and made it quite a good name for about himself as an academic. And then he was looking for the Nag Hammadi materials that were also discovered in the late 40s, early 50s. And uh, he uh, had an attack of appendicitis in the desert and didn't get uh, out of the desert to, uh, to uh, get treatment and he died. But he didn't work on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And had he worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls, he probably would have um, really made a lot of uh, intelligent um, evaluations based also on that material. So his death was um, unfortunate for scholarship, but he did write some of those books, Jesus and the Zealots in, the, in 1957, I think that came out, and uh, The Fall of Jerusalem in the Early Church, I think that came out in 1951 or something. I think he died after around 1957, 1960 or something. Uh, so, any case, we know who this, no, we don't know who this is. People assume it's Agrippa I. But as I've tried to show in my work, Agrippa I does have a brother called Herod, called Herod of Chalcis. And uh, it may just as well be Agrippa I, uh, uh, Herod of Chalcis. It makes more sense that it's Herod of Chalcis since they call him Herod the king. It may just be accurate in this case. He, uh, but who is Herod of Chalcis? He would be a grandson of the great Herod. Anyway, there's. There's, these are both brothers. They call them Herod Ag Agrippa, and that would be one, and Herod of Chalcis, a town where he originally had a 